Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Worlds Without Number. So this is a role-playing game by Kevin Crawford, who you may know as the author of things like Stars Without Number or Godbound. Um, this is in the same vein in that it is a giant meaty book designed for uh, running open world sandbox campaigns. Uh, however, instead of being in outer space or focusing on demigods, as some of his previous books have done, this does more classic fantasy. It's a little bit surprising that it's taken Kevin Crawford so long to do a book in this vein, um, but I think what he was trying to do is really flesh out some of those areas of role playing that weren't as covered, like sandbox sci-fi campaigns before he got, finally got into fantasy. And boy, is it worth the wait. Uh, this book is quite a beast, and we're gonna be doing this in two parts. Uh, the first part is going to cover character creation and the rules of play. And the second part is going to be the latter section of the book, which is focusing on uh, creating your own campaign and all the tools that he gives you to do that. There are a few different versions of this book that you can pick up. This is the offset print edition, which is very professionally done. It's all stitch bound, it lays flat, it has like these ribbon bookmarks and so on. However, I'm not sure if that's still gonna be available when this uh, video comes out, because I think they do sell pretty quickly. However, the print on demand versions and the PDF versions will still be available, of course, and those will be linked down in the description below. And even there, there's a couple different things. There's a free edition of the PDF, which is like 95% of this book, really everything that you need to run the game. And there's also the complete edition if you want some of those extras. So make sure you decide which one that you want. At least check out the free PDF because it's really amazing what he gives you for free. All right, let's check out the beginning section of this book, but first a quick word from today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Into the AM and their series of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror-themed t-shirts. They have a huge variety of these available on their website, covering basically every theme that you could possibly imagine. No matter what game you're running, you're probably gonna find some shirt that matches it, if you're the sort of person that likes to match the game that you're running to your wardrobe. They've sent me a whole bunch of these and they all look really great. They're really comfortable and they're really affordable too. Right now they have a deal going on where for $60, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle. And by using the link in the description below, you can get an additional 10% off on top of that. Thanks again to Into the AM. Inside the book, we start off with a nice map of this uh, fantasy landscape that Kevin has created as the campaign setting. Of course, it's totally optional. Uh, the world is very much in the vein of uh, The Dying Earth by Jack Vance, where it's the distant future and the world is just covered with the debris from past civilizations. Some of it human, some of it uh, fantasy races, some of it alien outsiders. So if, if anyone is familiar with games like Numenera, this is in a similar vein, but it, it goes back to the earliest um, novels that were covering that theme by uh, Jack Vance. This allows for a lot of great sword and sorcery, and it allows for basically anything that you can imagine in fantasy land, you can fit somewhere in here. Of course, early D&D often did have sci-fi elements to it. You could be exploring a dungeon and then discover that you were in a crashed UFO, and this definitely leans into that. As I mentioned before, great printing on the offset uh, print run. So this just covers the basics of what you're doing. If you've run any kind of OSR game before, then you know the basics here. This is definitely in the OSR vein in the sense that characters are fairly fragile. They die pretty quickly and you can make them relatively fast. Um, although it is a little bit more intensive than what you typically see in very fast and simplified OSR. That's not what this is. This is definitely more robust in terms of its rule set. However, However, it does have that attitude that the game is going to be very player run and the players are going to be exploring the world. They're going to be making their own decisions and uh, the game master is going to be reacting to that. So at the end of each session, the game master can just ask the players, where do you plan on going next? And then base uh, his prep on that. Players are gonna be living and dying by their choices. So this is not gonna be about creating plots for players to follow. This is gonna be about creating uh, locations and environments for them to explore and to create their own stories. Uh, Legates or Legates, however you say it, um, is these uh, advanced superhuman uh, level characters, um, which it does have rules for in the back of here, but I think that's reserved for the complete edition. You don't get it in the free edition. Um, although, in my opinion, if you're going to be running superhuman level characters, then you should probably pick up Godbound, which is the previous book by uh, Kevin Crawford about godlike characters, which has a lot of advice and tools specifically for that. Uh, there's a lot of art. Well, actually, there's not a lot of art. There's occasionally big splash pages, um, and it's very like colorful and um, 
fairly well done, but it just doesn't really grab my attention. It, a lot of it is pretty generic. Um, so that was a bit disappointing. It definitely doesn't pull you into a particular vision of the world. It's all just kind of generic fantasy landscapes and situations. Um, I really wish that these books would have a more specific, more idiosyncratic art style, something that really drew you in. Because um, as it is, most of the book is occasional big splash pages, and the rest of it is just giant blocks of text. The text is very well done, it's very easy to read, and the layout is very good as well, since everything is done on these one or two page spreads. Um, but just having more art in here, even if it was just black and white art to help break things up, would I think be helpful. Right away we get a summary of character creation. If you've ever played Stars Without Number, this is going to look really familiar, because it's basically the same system. In fact, the two games are very compatible. You can take stuff from one and just drop it into the other, and it's going to work perfectly well. You could be exploring the galaxy in Stars Without Number and come across a kind of fantasy medieval planet, and boom, now you're playing Worlds Without Number. Uh, you have your six basic attributes, just like in any D&D game, that also have modifiers that go along with it. But the modifiers are, are much lower. Um, they go just from negative two to positive two. So it's much more constrained in that sense. You're going to have a background uh, that can help give you skills. There is a skill system that relies on 2d6 instead of on 1d20. You're going to have a class to choose from, but you're also going to be able to customize your own class if you want to combine uh, a couple of the main classes together. So there is a multi-classing system here for people who want to be an adventurer rather than just one particular archetype. There's also foci, I think I'm saying that correctly, um, which are feats. They're a, a focus that your character takes that helps specialize them in one particular aspect of play. And they're quite uh, powerful. They really set your character apart. And there's not a million of them, but there's a nice variety that you really can customize who you want to be. Hit points remain pretty low. So they go anywhere from 1d6 minus 1, which is for wizards, all the way up to 1d6 plus 2 for fighters. So you're always rolling a d6 and just adding and tweaking it a little bit. It's going to be modified by your constitution as well. Um, but this means that even at a very high level, and then 10 is usually the highest level you can get to, you're not going to have giant buckets of hit points. Uh, really, if you're, you're rolling an 8, uh, and then maybe you're adding two if you have a really good constitution. A warrior might have 80 hit points or 100 hit points at the extreme end. Uh, generally, it's going to be a lot lower than that, maybe around 70 or 75. And if you're a wizard, it could be around 40 or so as, at the highest that you get. Uh, so things are going to remain dangerous all throughout gameplay. This does use the base attack bonus. There's a little table for it next to each class, uh, similar to what we see in Pathfinder or in uh, third edition Dungeons and Dragons. Armor class is ascending, which is really easy to learn. Uh, if you've ever played any kind of D&D, this will be very, very familiar. You got your saving throws, again, very 3.0 or Pathfinder in the sense that there's three of them, physical, evasion, and mental. Actually, there's four. There's one that's luck as well, which your modifiers don't change at all. In a lot of ways, this reminds me of a very streamlined and cleaned up version of 3rd Edition. Uh, like 3rd Edition D&D, there's quite a bit of customization that's possible here. There's a lot of, you know, feats, there's skills, and all of this stuff. But the number of um, modifiers and the size of those modifiers is kept much more constrained. So if you liked 3rd Edition, but you thought it got really bloated, this could also be a really good choice. Because it takes that and it makes it much easier to grasp, it makes it faster to make the characters, and it keeps things just limited. Skills, as I mentioned before, are all based on 2d6. So they start at level zero, where you're not adding anything to your skill. All that does is it prevents you from taking a penalty when using the skill, all the way up to level four, where you're adding four to your 2d6. And that's only for very high level characters. So you move up these skill ranks very slowly. You're not adding, you know, plus 14 or things like that to your skills. Um, everything is kept within a very particular curve. Here's our list of skills. I think there's a, about 21 possible skills here. Some of these skills you actually do add to D20 rolls. So some of these skills are combat related and you'll be adding those to your attack rolls, but generally they're just used for skills. We have some backgrounds here, 20 of them. And on the next page, we start getting into uh, the skills that those provide for you. So for example, if you're a courtesan, then you start off with perform zero, just as a free skill. If you want to, you can just pick these quick skills here, or you can roll randomly to help determine what they are. There's rules for all of that. So it allows for making characters really quickly and surprising yourself, or going through and selecting exactly what you want. Uh, any of those are possibilities. Now we get into the different classes in the game. There's basically three classes. The expert, which is like the thief, the mage, and the warrior. And you are allowed to combine those two if you want to make a uh, mixed custom class. 
Uh, the expert um, starts off with just 1d6 per level of hit points. Their attack bonus goes from plus zero to plus five, and they're gonna be taking more skills. That's one of their um, basic uh, abilities here. They take extra skills every time they level up, so you're gonna have a lot more options there. You also get advantage or rerolls uh, on skill checks. So if you wanna be the skill monkey, that's what you choose. You got the mage here. As we get into further in the book, we'll see that there's lots of subclasses for mage. So when you pick a mage, you pick what kind of mage you're gonna be. That's gonna help determine the different spells that are available to you. You have very low hit points and your attack bonus starts at plus zero and only becomes a plus one by the time you get to level five. So you're not gonna be fighting stuff. Uh, you can make a slightly more combat oriented mage by picking a certain subclasses where you can be more like a monk. Um, and you, if you boost up some of your skills, like your fighting skills, then you can get an okay chance at being a combatant. Uh, if you really wanna be a fighting mage though, you probably want a multi-class with fighter. And the warrior or the fighter is our last class here. Um, attack bonus goes up once every single level and you have 1d6 plus two hit dice uh, in hit points. And some of their class abilities really makes them a powerhouse in combat. So for example, you have Killing Blow, which allows you to um, add half of your character level rounded up to any damage done. So you're doing way more damage than everyone else. And Veteran's Luck allows you to take any miss in combat uh, once per combat and turn it into a hit. So you're gonna be hitting people a lot more and really dishing out the damage. Adventurer is, this, is the section on how you multi-class. Basically, you just pick one of these, depending on whether you want to be an expert in warrior or an expert in mage or a mage and a warrior. And it just alters what your progression is going to look like. And it's going to change what abilities from each of these classes that you're going to get. You just follow the instructions right here. That makes multi-classing quite easy to do. Your foci are like your feats, and each of them has two levels. So you can pick one, and then later on you can upgrade it to make it even better. So for example, you might have something like Die Hard, where you're surprisingly hard to kill. At level one, you just get an extra two maximum hit points uh, per level. This works retroactively. And if you choose it again to boost it even better, then the first time each day that you are reduced to zero hit points by an injury, you instead survive with one hit point remaining. There's lots of variety here, allowing you to do anything from uh, use armor while uh, using magic at the same time, to being an assassin, a close combatant. You could be a better diplomat or an imposter if you like sneaking around and deceiving people, a polymath, a rider, trap master, uh, whirlwind assault. You got lots of different things that you can do. It doesn't go on forever, see it only ends here. So there's like one, two, three, four, five, six pages of it. Um, but they're quite impactful and they do make a big difference. When choosing equipment, there are some packages that you can just pick up right at the start of the game, or you can roll some coins and then go further back in the book and do your shopping. There's a full example of creating a character here along with a nice, very functional character sheet. It's mostly complete, but I feel like there's an, a page that's missing uh, in the sense that there's really not a place to write all of your inventory or all of your spells if you're a wizard. There's a couple other derived attributes which only come into play sometimes, like uh, effort for wizards. We'll talk about that later. It's not really a good place to record that. So maybe you would need to use the back of your sheet or perhaps create a second sheet that just flesh things out a little bit more. Because this is a game of open world exploration, you are of course going to have an encumbrance system. So the encumbrance is based on strength. Uh, half of your strength score uh, can be used to tr have your uh, readied items. So on your character sheet that would be here. The items that you're able to grab really quickly whenever you want to. And then your full strength score uh, is how many things that you can stow in your backpack. You're gonna, like I said, probably have to have another sheet to keep track of that. But that's gonna be really important because um, whenever you're doing overland travel, you need to know how much you can carry, how much you can pick up, and especially resources. Um, when you're doing on, going on long journeys, are you gonna have enough food, enough water? Are you gonna have enough gold to, or enough room to carry the gold out of the dungeon? All of that stuff. Uh, if you're hand waving it, then you're gonna have a much harder time doing this type of game. We've got some rules for uh, hirelings and day labor, uh, how to do armor, it's pretty straightforward, all your different weapon varieties. One interesting thing about weapons, well, I guess we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about combat, is they have this shock value, which is also a thing in Stars Without Number. Well, what shock value is, is it allows you to do damage even when you miss. So for example, uh, this Halberd does 1d10 damage, but it also has shock value of two AC 15, which means that you, if you miss the enemy 
and their ace and their um, armor class is 15 or lower, then you can still do two damage to them. This means that combat's going to go a lot more quickly because you're just going to be doing damage. Well, both sides are, uh, even when they miss. There's going to be not a lot of rounds where everyone just swings and misses. Instead, damage is going to be coming in pretty consistently. In some ways, this reminds me a bit of Into the Odd, which goes straight to just damage rolling. Uh, this doesn't go that far, but it does help mitigate uh, long combats. And combats aren't going to be long anyway, just because hit points are so low. Now we start getting into the rules of the game with some great advice on putting these systems into play. So for example, be willing to translate actions into roles. The GM decides what is role. The GM makes the rules and hold these rules lightly. Don't get caught up in the systems. It's about trying to make the world seem real and keeping the game going. If you need to look things up later, then just do that. We have a section on scenes, turns, and durations here. This is just about time, which is a really important thing to track in any kind of open world game. Scene is a unit of time used in worlds without number. It's a basic measurement for most effect durations. It's simply one general event or activity. That's a little bit vague. I understand that it probably works for most game purposes. I would try and make it a bit more concrete and say that it's about 10 minutes, the same as a turn, which is a unit of time in a dungeon just to keep things unified. It also advises that you have a calendar on hand so you can track time in the game world so you know when seasons go by. That's a great little touch that not a lot of people do, but I think it really helps. Section on skill checks here. So we have different check difficulties. Like I said, you're rolling 2d6, adding a couple of small numbers and trying to hit your target number here. Six are very easy things, 14 for nearly impossible things. And also it reminds you, don't call for skill checks when what they're doing would reasonably succeed or reasonably fail. So if you're walking up to a king and telling him and uh, demanding that he give you his kingdom, you don't roll a skill check for that because that's not a reasonable thing uh, to ask. There's no uh, reasonable likelihood of that happening. So use common sense. The rules for combat here are quite straightforward and easy to learn, not too surprising if you've played D&D &D before. You have your main actions, move actions, and you have some actions that are on turn, where you use on your turn, instant, you can use them anytime. Um, making to hit rolls is just what you would expect. You add a couple of modifiers, usually your attribute um, modifier, possibly a skill modifier, and maybe one or two other ones. So there's a little bit more math here than we typically see in OSR games. It just has a higher level of crunch. Nothing too onerous, but just keep that in mind. We have some to hit roll modifiers, shock damage, which I mentioned before, just to keep the damage flowing. If you're a fighter, especially, you'll be dealing out a lot of shock damage. So you'll become a death dealing machine. The rules for shoving and grappling are actually quite nice as well. You really can grab onto someone, and then if you hold onto them, you can just keep pummeling them as you roll around on the floor. There's a nice table here for common combat actions. Uh, some of them are kind of interesting. Like There's a swarm attack where a bunch of different characters can make a swarm attack action by taking this all together, and then do a lot more damage by ganging up on someone all at once. There's other feats later on that allow certain classes or characters to negate that, but it does add for another level of tactics especially when you have things like charging where you can rush in and do some extra damage. You can try and shatter people's shields, uh, have total defense, screening an ally is especially good. By taking this action successfully, then any damage directed at one guy gets directed at you instead. So even if you're not using a uh, combat grid, there's a lot of things that you can think about in terms of uh, who's gonna go first, the order that you're gonna take these actions in, who are you gonna protect, all of those things are gonna come into play. We have three different examples of combat here just so we can see how combat would work in different uh, situations. And is they're pretty quick because combat's gonna be short when you're dealing shock damage and you have low hit points. We have our system for injury, healing, and system strain here. So in one sense, characters are a bit more hardy than in other OSR games because when you get to zero hit points, you don't die immediately. However, you are mortally wounded. And if someone manages to stabilize you and heal you up to one hit point or so, you can continue acting again, but you are now frail. You have a new frail condition, which is only cured by a week of bed rest. Um, if you are frail and you go down to zero hit points again, you're just dead. So that really makes you wake up and think, okay, I need to be much more careful or possibly start retreating once characters are frail. There's a little bit of this buffer here so that you can continue on uh, in the game while not making you in any way immortal. There's a system called System Strain here, which also limits the amount of healing that you can take. Uh, characters have a System Strain rating equal to their constitution attribute. And a lot of times when you have uh, special effects like laying on hands or magical healing, that causes System Strain. And um, at a certain point, it's just not going to help you anymore. You're going to need to wait for a while for your system strain to slowly decrease back down to zero before you can start taking advantage of that healing again. This is a game of exploration. So of course, you have a system for overland travel, including sea travel, and rules for uh, exploring hexes, 
supplies for while adventuring, how to deal with pack animals, foraging, wandering encounters, all the stuff that you're going to need to go exploring hex by hex across a large continent, you know, trying to get food, trying to find points of interest, uh, and delving into locations. Site exploration is basically dungeon crawling, and it's nice that it has a full suite of rules, very similar to the stuff that you normally see in D&D, for crawling through a dungeon and exploring it. How to keep time in a dungeon, that's going to be really important, of course. What's nice is that he has a detailed version of these rules, and also a simplified version, because some people don't like all of the nitty gritty of dungeon tracking, so you can simplify that a bit to keep things going a bit faster. I like the system for rolling encounter checks as well. Uh, typically in BX D&D, the rule is every two turns you roll a D6 and there's a one in six chance of having an encounter. What this does is it tells you um, the number of turns that you're going to, in between which you roll a D6, is going to vary depending on how dangerous the dungeon is. You can sort of determine that by looking at this chart here and then know how often to roll. Character advancement is a little bit more abstracted than we typically see in OSR games, where it's often just XP for gold. Um, here we, you get about three XP in a successful session. So if you want to go fast leveling, then you'll get to level two in one session and then to uh, level three after you know, one more session. Then it's going to take, you know, two more sessions to get to level four and so on. But there's also a slower leveling version as well. Uh, later on in the book, he talks about different ways that you can give players XP for different types of things. So it could be for spending gold. It could be for, you know, carousing. It could be for accomplishing goals or quests. And you can mix and match and talk to your players about what you want to incentivize and how you want to give out that XP. Of course, there's no problem with simply swapping in a whole different XP tree from a different game, right? You could just use normal BX uh, XP for gold and it wouldn't really affect anything at all if that's what you wanted to do. Whenever you level up, you gain some skill points you can spend on buying some new skills. However, as you uh, want the skills to get higher and higher, the cost in skill points gets exponentially higher and higher as well. So it's gonna get really expensive to get things up to a high level. And there's also a minimum character class. So for example, you can't get any skills to level four until you're at level nine. Uh, that's just to keep things under control so you don't have, you know, these really early on characters, these brand new characters that are, you know, a grand master at artisanry or something like that. You can also spend these skill points to improve your attributes. However, that becomes quickly very expensive and you can only do it five times throughout the entire life of your character. Um, so you're probably going to focus on the attributes that are pretty close to that threshold where they bump up and get uh, an, another plus one in their modifier and you're probably not gonna be able to boost your really low ones up too much, unless you're just trying to get out of the negatives. One thing that's unusual is that there is a system for modifying and customizing equipment. So this isn't even magical stuff. If you just have a piece of equipment and you wanna create uh, upgrades so it has a longer arm, or it has a better aim, or it has a razor's edge, or things like that, you're basically, it's a little bit steampunky where you're just adding on these modifications. There's a system for doing that if you want characters that are just into being artisans and blacksmiths. One absolutely fabulous thing is that there is a system quick reference sheet. So all of the stuff, mostly to do with combat, is all summarized on one easy to read sheet. So you can just photocopy this or just print it out if you have a PDF, give it to all the players, and that's it. It's also just really helpful for DMs to refresh themselves. When you're reading this, some of it is a little bit more complicated than you typically see in OSR games. So I was just trying to think to myself, how does this all fit together? And then boom, Kevin just gives it to you. That is really thinking about what DMs need. This latter section of the character creation section is all about magic, including a lot of the wizard subclasses, if you want to call them that. Uh, as I mentioned, this is um, a very dying earth, Jack of Bansian type game which means that it is very arcane. Uh, characters are memorizing spells, but it really leans into the weirdness of Jack Vance in a way that it typically doesn't in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, the characters or wizards are going to be memorizing fewer spells than a wizard would in typical D&D. However, those spells are gonna be significantly more powerful. Uh, so the spell levels only go from one through five, I believe. Um, but if you wanna think about that in D&D terms, you have to double it. So like a level three spell in this game is like a level six spell in D&D. &D. So even starting at your first level, you're memorizing your basic spells. You only have like one or two of them, but they're going to be, they're going to pack a much bigger punch. So as a wizard, it's going to be much more about standing back, uh, thinking about the spell options that you have, and then unleashing just the one or two spells you have available at the exact right time to turn the tide of battle. 
I mentioned before how there is a adventure character class where you can combine two different classes together. It's also possible to be a mage that's built out of two different mage subclasses or different mage traditions, they're often called. And so you can combine two of these together to create your own kind of custom wizard if you want to do that. Here we have the high magic spell list. So this is the list of spells for the high mages, which are the classical Vancean mages. And what I really love is that the names are so good. They're so much better than typical D&D spell names. So for example, you could have uh, Glass Chimes of the Bamboo Terrace, or the Torment of Tumification, or the Calculation of the Phantasmal Eidolon. You can just imagine your wizard screaming this out loud as he casts his spell. It's great. You feel like a real weirdo wizard, which is exactly how I like to feel. Another nice thing is that of these spells, of course there are some damage dealing spells, but they're really the minority. There's much fewer of them than you would find in standard D&D. Uh, most of these spells are problem solving spells. They alter the environment, they alter other characters, they change the situation. So they're about problem solving, and that's what I like most about wizards. Uh, they're there to have that one spell up their sleeve that changes the situation in an unexpected way. And Kevin has really leaned into that here, and I highly approve. We can see our chart for spells down here. So if you're a full high mage, at levels one and two, you're only going to be able to cast one spell a day, which is less than you find in even BX D&D. However, you can memorize quite a few spells at once, especially as you get higher up. You have a lot of spells in your head, even if you can't cast that many of them. So you do have a lot of strategic options that you can ponder. Also, to help mitigate the fact that you're casting less spells, all wizards have something called arts. And so these arts are powered by something called efforts. There's a whole separate pool of, I don't know what you want to call it, magic, mana, points, something. And you can spend these to do these minor magical effects. And each wizard class has these uh, effects. They're kind of like cantrips. You can think of them that way, but you can't cast them infinitely because you have to spend a resource for them. If you're a high mage, almost all of these arts are going to be meta magic. So they're going to be altering your spells in different ways, shaping them, creating exceptions and things like that. So if you, that's the kind of wizard you want to play, you want to be a high mage. Here's the whole list of the spells of the high mages. Man, these names are so great, like Banishment, the Black Glass Labyrinth. For example, you can take a whole bunch of people and then banish them to another dimension. That is, let's see what it says here. It's a lightless extra dimensional maze of endlessly tall obsidian walls and they just wander around until they starve to death. Here's another one. In normal D&D, this would be, I guess, stone to mud. Here it's called the Decree of Lithic Dissolution. And then we start getting into some other subclasses. You have Elementalists, for example. So their arts are going to be elemental summoning. So if you want to be something like, you know, a fire mage or like the last airbender, you want to be an elementalist. You'll be able to shoot elemental blasts, basically, in conjunction of, in addition to also having elemental spells. So they have their own elemental spells. It's shorter than the high mage list. They are also allowed to use high mage spells, but they're going to get less of them. So they're going to get a blend of these, this new magic and the uh, high mage spells. Same thing for healers. Healers don't actually get a spell list at all. Instead, they just have this healer arts section. So you're going to be spending that effort pool to heal people faster. And some of them get quite powerful. We have necromancers, and they do have their own spell list relating to, you know, necromancy, like you'd expect. Uh, the Vowed. The Vowed is basically the monk class. You're not allowed to take Vowed as its own class. It's always a half class. So you're taking a Vowed, uh, so it'll be uh, partially Vowed, partially Fighter, or partially Vowed, partially Expert, and you can create, you know, your theme around what your monk is. They don't get any spells either. They just get a lot of, you know, Kung Fu effort uh, arts. And they're going to get really powerful uh, punch damage, all the way up to 1d10 plus 3. They're going to be able to punch harder, and they, their punches do shock damage as well, which normally doesn't happen for typical characters. There's whole rules here for developing new spells. So Kevin gets into the you know, framework that he uses for figuring out how powerful a spell should be. So you can think about that while you're developing them on your own, or allowing players to create their own. Building magical working. So this is long lasting magical effects, right? Usually anchored around an artifact that's not movable, that creates a large effect over long periods of time. So a, a supreme level one would be like affecting the flow of time in the area or implant an artificial mind in a structure. Whereas a more simple one could be provide cooking heat in specific places within the area, like everlasting cooking pots. You wanna be creating magic items, we got rules for that. And then we're gonna start getting into the world building and the world creation section of the book. We're going to leave that for our next video because this one has been long enough, so stay tuned for that. Um, overall, the rules in here are more crunchy than you typically see in OSR games, um, but they are very well fleshed out and very well thought out. 
So if your characters want a more tactical game where they have skills and they have feats, but you don't want things to get super bloated, I think this would be a really good choice for that. It's clearly designed for long-term play and for characters that develop in very particular ways over long campaigns. So check out the links in the description below if this looks appealing to you. As I mentioned, there is a free version of it as well as a paid version if you want the whole thing. Next time we're gonna be taking a look at all of the tools for building your own campaigns for which Kevin has become so famous. Before we go today, quick shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Eric Tolbert, Lynn Solve, Alexander Wallace, Austin W. Hoffman, Eric Brimstem, Matthias Johansson, Grayson Yant, Jonathan, Dorge, Wendell, Jessen, and Chris Jones. Thank you so much for supporting the channel and thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you next time.